So as we discussed, the critical load, the PCR that um, we just uh, calculated was independent of material strength and it only related to the geometry of your cross section. So the second moment of area as well as its length as well as its material. Yeah, so it's independent of the yield stress. So, a column made of very strong material, such as high-strain steel, offers no advantage over a column made of low-strain st steel. So, pay attention that both of them have the same material. One of them is high-strain, so Fy is very high. One of them is low-strain, so Fy is lower. But both of them have the same elastic modulus because they have same steel, but really doesn't have any advantage in terms of buckling. Both of them will suffer because really it relates to the cross section, to its material, which both of them are the same, as well as its length. So even if you have a high strength steel, that means that you will reach yielding point much later, but it doesn't mean that you will not have buckling in it. Now on the other side, because we have force, if you remember, uh, stress was let's say force over area so knowing this formula I can calculate the, the critical uh, stress due to the buckling as well which will be PCR over area so it will be P2EI A times L now looking at this bit a i over a is the radius of gyration to the power of two so this is the radius of gyration so if i have this and i replace this over here i will have my critical stress like this over r to the power of two simple replacement maths this is called slenderness ratio of the column. And how does it work? The more the slenderness ratio you have, your critical stress will be reduced, which will be problematic. So you want always your slenderness ratio to be very small. So the let's say the critical stress that your column will not reach to buckling will be much higher. So we have proven how to solve for PCR. Then you used PCR to calculate the critical stress. And then we just replaced these two with the radius of gyration and we came up with this. This ratio, remember, is called the slenderness ratio of the column. And it makes sense because we were saying that let's say buckling happens in slender and long columns so from this we can see that the critical stress formula shows that the critical stress is proportional to the modulus of elasticity of the material so e and the inversely proportional to the square of the slenderness ratio of the column l over r yes in this case you see we only have two bits one is slenderness ratio and one is E, so directly related to material, inversely related to the slenderness ratio. Now, if I plot this, the plot of stress versus slenderness ratio, stress over slenderness ratio. So as we go to this side, we have more slender columns as we move up we have stronger columns now looking at this plot assuming for the same material so my material is steel and its yielding point is 250 megapascals yeah so this let's say is my yielding point fy now, assuming that this is for the same material, so Fy is the yielding point, 250 megapascals, same material, all steel, the same E then, I'm just increasing 
the slenderness ratio, meaning my columns are becoming more slender. As you can see, as my columns become slender, it's more susceptible to buckling because the stress which the buckling happens is reducing and reducing and reducing. So there is a higher chance that the column over here with such slenderness ratio will never ever reach to its yielding uh, failure because before reaching its yielding failure, it has already failed due to buckling. So increase of buckling susceptibility and for shorter columns, meaning for here shorter columns, because the slenderness ratio is smaller, the failure happens due to yielding. So this proves the first discussions that we had. The more slender your column is, highly susceptible to buckling, and probably the failure will happen due to that buckling. The more shorter and stocky column you have, meaning the slenderness ratio is smaller, means that there is a higher chance that your failure will be due to reaching to the yielding point and passing it. So your failure will be due to plastic deformation. Now the critical load and the critical stress that we calculated was for a beam with pin-pin conditions at both ends, pin and pin. And then if this, let's say, column buckles, it will be something similar to this, a perfect buckle and with a maximum at its middle. But what happens if my connection ends or end conditions changes? Now I have a fixed end with a free end. What happens here? Do I still get the same bending? No. So I'm applying a compression again, and instead of having such a stomach, it becomes like this, compared to this. Now we have done some calculations and we've seen that if I have a fixed end and a free end, the shape, the shape of this buckling is actually twice the length that I have. So this is my bending. Now if I have a free end, you see, it's not reaching the maximum yet because there's another maximum at its bottom as well from the other side, exactly like what you see here. So we look at the column with a one free end at point A and a load P and one fixed end at point B, so it's the ground. We can see that the column behaves as the upper half of the pin connected column that we just saw. The critical load for this column is thus the same as the pin-ended column and can be calculated from Euler's formula, the same formula that we have, by using a column length equal to twice the actual length of the given column. So if this was my formula generally for, let's say, the pin-pin-ended column, in case suddenly this changes to a free end with a fixed end on the other side, fix, free, pin, pin, suddenly because the shape, the length of this buckling is twice that length, I will use only the, the length in a different way. This length that I change due to the conditions is called the effective length of the column. The effective length of the column is estimated for any column considering its end supports, as we did as well. So it was pin pin in the beginning, then I change it to free, fixed, and then the LE changed. Similar to that, because LE changes, then my critical stress changes as well. So my critical load and my critical stress. Nothing else changes, only LE changes. Why? Because the buckling shape of my columns are changing. Now, as we discussed, depending on the end conditions that you have, 
this LE changes. And because LE, the effective length changes, your critical load and the critical stress will change accordingly as well. So let's have a demonstration. So pin pin, this is where we calculated the formula, as you can see, is exactly the same formula that we have. And it was something similar to this. Yeah, as you can see, the drawing simply just approves it as well. Yeah, now let's go to the next one. Fix, fix, fix and fix. So do you think it will have the same case? No, as you can see, the beginnings are kind of straight and then a massive stomach in the middle. Now it says, let's do it as fix pin. So I will remove my fix and I'll just add a pin. Zoop. What happens here? You see, the stomach has moved toward the pin, as exactly the drawing has demonstrated as well. And someone has calculated and said that the, elast uh, the, the effective length of this is 0 0.7 times the actual length of your column. So if this, the effective length was equal to L, in case of fix fix, my uh, effective length will be half the length and if it's fixed pin my effective length will be 0 0.7 times the length and then the discussion that we had as well the free end with a fixed end as you can see the rest of it is inside the ground is below my footing so the length will be twice the effective length will be twice the actual length of my column and because the length is twice then you see in the formula I have four times L to the power of two rather than L to the power of two what has happened here I just put L to the power of two I put two L to the power of two and then I get four L to the power of two and I put it here the same thing happens here 0 0.7 L goes to the power of 2, we bring it up, as well as here, half to the power of 2, and it goes up. So effective length changes the critical load that we have, depending on the conditions that you have in your support. This is simply how we extend that Euler theory to other columns with other end conditions, rather than just pin-pin. If you remember, one of the assumptions that we did for the Euler's theory was that the load applied, the applied load of my compressive actual force, will be applied to the center point, the centroid of my column. But unfortunately, in real world, this usually doesn't happen. So if you just look at a frame from the side, it looks something similar to this. So there are some loads on top of this. And then there is no guarantee that the resultant of all of these forces will be perfect to the axis of the centroid of your column. There is always a small chance that there will be a little bit of divergence like this. You see, if this is the axis, the blue dashed line, the force is not perfectly at that point. And as we said, because moment is force times is perpendicular distance, because of this let's say a little bit distance between the centroid and the force applied there will be a moment due to this distance that distance is called eccentricity so the distance between the line of action p and the axis of the column is known as eccentricity it's extremely small so it's hard to see but this distance this small distance is e which acts like a perpendicular distance. Now, if I put this P to the center in order to calculate the Euler's theory and the critical force, I will have another problem as well. I will have a moment which is generated by that eccentric distance. This concept of eccentricity and its resultant moment will be something that you will learn in coming years of structural uh, courses. Uh, you will also learn about the effect of material imperfection on the buckling as well as torsional buckling which is due to lateral loadings, something similar to an earthquake or a very strong wind. As you saw, this was a very short and simple lecture. There are two examples only. There is no uh, problem worksheets for this um, 
let's say lecture 10 so just simply go through the examples the solutions are already given for example one you have to just replace the numbers so you can get familiar with how uh, sophisticated the calculation is example two is more challenging so you have the solutions as well so thank you very much and hope you have learned about column buckling see you later